Aki Manabuti or Dr. Manabuti or Professor Manabuti. I started Third World Press in 1967 in my basement apartment about the size of a conference table that I shared with other unwanted animals. The idea was and came from my volunteering at the DuSable Museum back in 1962. When Malcolm X was assassinated in 65, <clears throat> uh, the great poet Dudley Randall uh, and the founder of Broadside Press, which existed in Detroit, Michigan, uh, came to Chicago to talk to Margaret Burroughs, who was one of the founders of the DuSable Museum, and she would co-edit a book on Malcolm. And I asked Dudley Randall if he would consider one of my poems which uh, he did. But when I went to Detroit to talk to Dudley Rand about signing my second book, the, uh, his office was in this home, as well as the museum, the first location of the museum was in Margaret and Charlie's home. So I said, I got this. And so after two poetry readings, which I earned about $400, I used that to start the press. So from a one room apartment, to where now we occupy uh, headquarters on the south side of Chicago, which is you know pretty much a half a block that we purchased about 25 years ago. And what is important about this location is that it's in the middle of the black community on the south side of Chicago. It's not transitional, it's not touching other communities, it's in the middle of our community. And that was purposeful. We have to become decision makers about our own lives. Because if you're making decisions, that means that there are other people making choices within the parameters of your decisions. And so looking at what Margaret Barrows and Charlie Barrows and others were doing, as well as my uh, other mentors, who were not only Dudley Randa, but Hort W. Fuller, who was one of the founders of Obasi and the editor, managing editor of Negro Digest Black World Magazine, as well as uh, Barbara Ann Sizemore, who became the first um, superintendent of schools at Washington, D.C., and then the, 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 the poet, first black to win the Pulitzer Prize, first black to really win so many honors, she was the first black to be the poor lawyer of the state of Illinois, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, eventually became my cultural mother. So I stand on their shoulders, and as a result of standing on their shoulders, uh, I felt that I could never betray them. And that's why these institutions exist, our, our three schools and, and Third World Press and Third World Press Foundation. I came out of the black liberation struggle. And I remember quite clearly we meeting in churches, black churches, Negro churches. And if you say anything that the minister could not agree with, you're not meeting there next week. So I just said, I know how to solve that problem, ownership. Ownership, you gotta own your own. And for the 55, going on 56 years of Third World Press, we published some of the major writers in the world. And in doing that, it has allowed us to build a kind of a financial platform that has allowed us to, uh, to continue on, which has not been easy. I mean, this is one of my books, uh, Black Men, Obsolete Single Dangers, over a million in print. Now, we did give over 150 million to 150,000 to prisoners throughout the country. We gave them to them, you know. And one of our major books is The Destruction of Black Civilization, which is over, easy over half a million copies in print. And we have, you know, all these bestsellers, and one of our major authors is Gwendolyn Brooks. We have over 14 of, of our books in print. And we will keep them in print as long as their world press stays alive. So this is where we are. And so we have to have independent black institutions, which essentially tell us the truth about our own identity and our own our history, politics, psychology, all the functional areas that humans uh, function in. You know, biology, most certainly entertainment, you know, athletics and so forth. Because we, in terms of our presence and in terms of our influence, we have influenced the world in terms of our own culture.
everybody want to be black. They don't like black people, but they want to be like us. Okay, so. It is important to understand that we now live in a time where reading is not at the top of the must do. Uh, young people are paying more attention to their phones rather than to a book. And what we are trying to do and continue to do over the, our 55, going on 56 years, is to make reading and books the center of our lives. Because if you don't, do not have a reading leadership, you do not have a reading fellowship, if you do not have a reading young people, then you're in trouble. You're in serious trouble. We're about here building what we call independent black institutions. And that the institutions that we built, we built ourselves. They're not built on white money, and grant money, or, or foundation money. But for the most part, well, 90% of what we do has been built by black people, the sweat of black people. And uh, which include you know, myself and others, and most certainly my wife, uh, Dr. Carol D. Lee. Uh, they know her here as Mama Safisha. So this, this whole idea around culture is critical in terms of any people who are in control of their own cultural imperatives, that they're about the healthy replication of themselves, and most certainly their children. If you don't know who you, who you are, you have lost the battle already, you see. And so you can go outside and ask 10 black people, how do you identify yourself? You're going to get 10, 10 different answers. And as long as that continues to happen, then you're going to be in serious trouble, you see. If you ask 10 serious Jewish people how do they identify themselves, you're going to get the same answer. Mm -hmm. 10 serious Catholics, 10 serious Irish, 10 serious Italians, you're going to get the same answer. But we have been indoctrinated. We have basically been seasoned to be who we're not. And that's why Third World Press, Third World Press Foundation, Betty Shabazz Academy, and Barbara and Sizemore Academy, and New Concept School exist, is to basically reverse that and to put us first. So people often ask me at 81, why do I continue to do this work? Well, I can do this work because I love black people. It's simple as that. I, I love black people, and, and my wife is the same. And as a result of that, we built these institutions because we believe in institutional structures, independent black institutions. Just like white people can have white institutions, you know, we got our own institutions. And so therefore, we do what we want to do here in terms of the betterment of our people. Understand that our charter is different than most of the other charters. Our charters are 501c3s as well as Third World Press. Third World Press is a 501c3. So it's not a business in terms of the business model, the community, these are charities, okay? In fact, I've never taken a salary from Third World Press or from the schools, nor my wife, okay? I've always worked in the academy for over 42 years, teaching at, at universities and colleges across the country, and never had, a diff had any problem getting a job in the academy. Um, and so what we've done and continue to try to do is to develop a model that other people in other cities and states can follow. So the key point is we never say sacrifice. It's always commitment. We've never had to sacrifice like other people say, well, I have to do, you know. No, we don't buy that language. We are, we are committed to black people. So therefore, you develop institutional structures that not only influence black people, but also reflect the best of black people. And that's what we've tried to do over the last uh, 55, 56 years with Third World Press and over 50 years with our schools. And yes, coming out of our schools, we got architects, we got medical doctors, we got uh, brothers and sisters were basically working in almost every field. We have teachers who went through our schools, are back now teaching in our schools. And we're one of the few organizational structures, the Institute of Positive Education, being a parent of our institutions, that 
you know, we came out of the 60s and we still exist. And I, I don't want to give the impression that it has not been difficult. It has been extremely difficult. Uh, my organizations now are basically multi-million dollar organizations. Okay? So anytime you have schools where you have over 700 students and you have uh, basically teachers and administrators who are paid equally at, at the same level that public schools teachers are paid, that's quite a bit. You know? And a publishing company that has built a publishing company that have published some of the major black writers in the nation, if not the world, still alive after 55 years. So I understand quite clearly uh, what it takes to do this kind of work. And it, it basically tears at every nerve. And we published a book by Ruby Dee back in about 20 some odd years ago, titled My One Good Nerve. You know? And of course, Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis uh, were um, supporters and mentors to me also. And I guess you heard about the, the, the terrible flood we had, but we were able to come out of the flood in one piece, primarily because a thousand, we did a GoFundMe page and a thousand people across the nation of all cultures, you know, uh, supported us and allowed us to not only meet our goal, but go over our goal uh, considerably. Yeah. And so it allowed us to stay whole. And out of the, we lost about 75% of our, close to 80% of our book inventory. And we've been able to replace, uh, as of today, about 50%. Yeah. And so we're bringing out a, a, a book that was destroyed almost every week. And then we, we've published all, this year already about four, four new books. And we got five or six in the hopper getting ready to come out over the next couple of months. So it's been a, a continued struggle. But I learned this from, from uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. And it helped me a great deal. And she said, because her religion was kindness. Okay. And I'm not as kind as she is, but I've learned to, to, to accept people wherever they are. Number one. And number two, not forget to ever say thank you. Thank you. And we move on.